From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And welcome back to the Cannabis Podcast. If this is your first time joining us, well, you are in for a bit of a ride. The next 30, 40, who knows how many minutes, we're going to talk about a bunch of things cannabis. It seems to be a passion I've developed over the years, still have, for cannabis. And I'm assuming you share a bit of that cannabis since you're here. So welcome. Today, well, let's see. We're going to look at how some provinces are struggling to find just the right number of cannabis retail stores they should be having. Another celebrity cannabis partnership kind of goes up in smoke, shall we say. I look at the five best vape cartridges and how some people are terrified of THC. On Cultivar Corner, well, we are going to twig some memories with some legacy hash from Mood Ring. And we're going to finish with a story about hitchhiking with an ounce of blonde Lebanese hash in my bag and the fun that ensued from that. All of that and more on episode 75 of the Cannabis Podcast. And before we dive into the meat of the episode, I want to start off with something that you're probably not supposed to do. You're probably not supposed to talk about negative reviews. You're probably not supposed to talk about one-star reviews. Well, to heck with it. Obviously, since I have been smoking cannabis since way before it became legalized, sometimes the rules were meant to be bent. So I'm bending this one because I, I actually think it's a pretty good review. Now, Let's remember that this is somebody who's listening to the podcast you are right now, the Cannabis Podcast, where the tagline is, a Canadian's cannabis culture, one toke at a time. And I think I've been pretty upfront about the purpose of me being here on the podcast. I'm going to get stoned and talk about cannabis. So with that as kind of your lead in, here's what the review was. It's a one-star review. I wanted to like this podcast, but honestly, this guy is too stone for me. <laughs> and that, like, I don't even need to read the rest of it because that's the only part that matters. And just about everybody I have told of that particular review has said, well, that's actually a five-star review. <laughs> and I tend to agree with them with that. So, so there you go. I'm breaking the rules again. <laughs> so if I am too stone for you, well, I'm not apologizing. That's my purpose for being here. Now, before we get started, I also want to do a shout out. Shout out to Sam, who recently started listening, is a frequent visitor to the store. Nice to see your face in the store today, Sam. And thanks for being a listener as well. And our first story today, actually a lot of the stories today, are coming from leafly.ca. And this one was written by Jesse B. Standiforth. And the headline is, Too Many Cannabis Retail Stores? Provinces Struggle to Find the Right Balance. It's hard to tell what constitutes a healthy cannabis market in Canada. Retail store numbers vary by province significantly, and the topic of how many cannabis stores is too many permeates the country. A part of the problem is that while Canada is federally legal, its provinces control retail sales and are varied in their approaches. Ontario, Alberta, and British Columbia are leading the pack in number of stores, and other provinces are quickly gaining ground. Ontario reaches 800 stores and counting. The Ontario Cannabis Store, OCS, announced that the province has reached 800 licensed retail stores. With the highest density of cannabis retail stores in the country, municipalities are hesitant to permit cannabis stores in their district. The number of cannabis stores in Toronto has been a frequent topic of a complaint from groups of non-cannabis business owners in neighborhoods with high concentrations of cannabis retail, and even some previously licensed cannabis retailers. Politicians are also torn about cannabis retail in their municipalities. Earlier this month, councillors for the Toronto suburb of Mississauga, Canada's sixth largest municipality, voted 8-4 to four to continue to allow the opting out of cannabis retail in their city. Mississauga is not alone in this approach. It's shared by nearly 70 other municipalities across Ontario, including adjacent Toronto suburbs Markham, with a population of over 300,000, Vaughan over 300,000 as well, and Richmond Hill at 195,000. However, the greater Toronto area doesn't have the same objection to cannabis retail. The OCS lists 246 cannabis stores within a 50-kilometer radius of the CN Tower, leaving Mississauga totally surrounded. Now, that isn't just an issue for Toronto and the surrounding GTA. 
Many provinces struggle with cannabis retail. Quebec, for example, doesn't allow privately owned cannabis retail and operates its public sector retailer, the SQDC, based on achieving legalization goals such as undercutting the illicit market. Recently, Saskatchewan lifted its limit on cannabis retail, which caused the number of stores in Saskatoon to tick upward. At the beginning of this month, the city of 325,000 had 24 stores, with eight more on the way, prompting similar discussions. There are few existing measures to determine how many cannabis retailers are enough versus too few or too many, according to Brock University business professor Michael J. Armstrong. Armstrong explained there is no one way to determine a healthy number of retailers, since what everyone hopes to achieve from cannabis retail is different. One measure he cautiously suggests is a comparison to Colorado, which industry watchers have described as an ideal balance of one store per 10,000 people. Armstrong doesn't want to put too much weight on Colorado, however. Colorado is a legal island surrounded by states that haven't legalized, so some of their business is going to be people driving across the border and coming in from out of state. I'm not even sure Colorado is stabilized yet. They're kind of an unusual situation, said Armstrong. The Colorado model at least is a number, and until we find out what works in Canada, it's a decent ballpark. And as a sidebar, we've talked about that before, that 10,000 people per cannabis retail store, because here in the central Okanagan, we have a bit of an issue in that particular ratio. Now back to the story. Another example of an ideal ballpark might be Alberta, who Armstrong said is the fastest province to license stores in a limitless private sector retail environment. After legalization, said Armstrong, Alberta fairly quickly got up into the high 400s. They're now a little over 600 stores. It's not quite stabilized, but it's certainly tapered off. They've had a few stores closed, but it's still been a net gain month to month. A little over 500 for a population of a little over 4 million. In the short term, at least, there's a Canadian ballpark, at least for private sector outlets. When cannabis retail comes up in discussion, the likeliest source of controversy is the issue of clustering, in which cannabis retailers open in close proximity to one another. Concerned citizens have been worried about neighborhoods becoming dominated by cannabis retailers long before legalization occurred. While some continue to complain about the issue in certain areas, Armstrong said clustering should not be understood as bad. Clustering just happens. We notice it because it's new. First, there's one cannabis store, and that's new. Then there's five. But then you wonder, where are the coffee shops? Where are the restaurants? They're often clustered. The difference between restaurants and cannabis stores is that every restaurant is able to offer something different, such as the style of food or the manner of cooking. There's little parallel for that in Canadian cannabis retail, where in most provinces, except Saskatchewan and Newfoundland, retailers must buy from the same pool of products as other retailers. Standing out from the pack is how cannabis retailers can survive the cull. That's also going to be part of a healthy ecosystem when you get that kind of differentiation, said Armstrong. One factor nobody predicted was the coronavirus. People are willing to hang on with mediocre profits while they're wondering how long this pandemic is going to go on and whether their competitors will go out of business, Armstrong said. My guesstimate is we'll eventually see that number go down, especially for larger chains. The OCS echoes Armstrong's predictions, publishing a year in review in which President Interim President and CEO David Lobo states, Unfortunately, this rapid growth will likely result in some retailers being faced with increased competition and a crowded marketplace which could result in some closures and market right-sizing. So there you go. Various provinces still struggling with the proper number of retail stores. Obviously, it's changed a lot since we first started this podcast, and we used to talk about it all the time because they were so slow at opening up, at least here in B.C. Still hasn't exploded like it has in Alberta and on, in Ontario, but there are more and more stores opening all the time, and that is a good thing. From studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And did you hear about the sad news in the celebrity partnership between Drake and Canopy Growth? Yeah, it's kind of up in smoke. Sorry for the obvious reference. The partnership between the rapper Drake and Canopy Growth, first announced in 2019, officially ended this week. In November 2019, Drake and Canopy Growth announced the More Life Growth Cannabis brand of which Canopy owned 40%, while Drake held the remaining 60% stake. Financial documents filed by Canopy Growth reveal the company took a $10.3 million loss in the deal and de-recognized another $33.7 million in future royalty payments to More Life. 
It was unclear why the divestment occurred, according to the report. At the time the deal was announced in 2019, Drake, whose full name is Aubrey Drake Graham, was identified as the new venture's founder. According to Investors.com, More Life Growth is licensed to produce and process cannabis in Ontario, Canada. Under the deal, CGC kept the facility and the rights to distribute cannabis. Drake is just one celebrity with whom Canopy Growth has partnered. Other such celebrities include Snoop Dogg, Martha Stewart, and Seth Rogen. Fast Company reports David Klein, whose mission was to make Canopy Growth an international consumer packaged goods corporation, said last year about their focus on celebrity-backed brands. One of our differentiators has to be knowing the consumer better than anyone, and we're going to be applying our science to do that. We've been doing it in all kinds of pharma pursuits, but we have human effect scientists who tell us that when you try a product, what it does physiologically, how you feel, that's their job to optimize for that, Klein told Fast Company. So my view is if we know what the consumer wants, we can use our human effects guide to help us figure out how to get that experience for the consumer, then package it underneath our brands and bring it to our consumers in safe and effective way. So there you go, Drake and Canopy Growth. Their partnership is no longer. <laughs> I've been asked a lot over the time of doing the podcast, various people have written in and wanted to know a lot more about vape cartridges and more specifically, if it could offer some opportunity for suggestions for what would be good quality vapes to do or to use or to buy. Well, let's dive into it. This is another story from Leafly, and this is written by Dante Jordan. People love vaping weed because of its health benefits, portability, and discretion. There are many different types of vaping systems. 510 threaded cartridges that work with most batteries. Pods or cartridges that only work with a specific company's hardware. Disposable pens that get tossed as soon as you finish, and the list goes on. So how do you find the best one? Combining quality weed, extraction skill, and vape hardware. Whatever experience you're looking for, we've got a list of the best vape cartridges money can buy. PAX Era Pods. PAX has been a leader in the vape pen game for years now. They have a slew of vape products to pick from, but their PAX Era is the belt of the ball. Their technology is heralded for its extremely smooth and flavorful hits, and their app is acclaimed for its personalization, allowing temperature and dose control throughout each session. PAX has partners in Arizona, California, and a whole bunch of different states, so pretty much if you live somewhere where cannabis is legal, you can definitely find a nice distillate, live resin, or solventless rosin PAX era pod at a dispensary nearby. Raw Garden 510 Cartridges They're delicious. Even more than delicious, they're effective. They will get you high as hell. An issue with vape carts in general for people who really smoke weed every day is that the high doesn't really get to that high. It's just a little tutor to keep you going until you get back to some actual flower or dabs. Well, Raw Garden's live resin cartridges will get you high. These vape batteries are powerful and long-lasting and work great with DMT vape cartridges too, just an FYI. Airgraft 2 Live Resin Pods Airgraft is a Canadian company that operates in California. At some point, they'll operate across the nation. Their claim to fame? A revolutionary vaping system that only heat never burns your oil due to the way heat is cycled through the battery and chamber. The reason they're on this list is because both their Aircraft 2 vape system and vape pod go hard. Especially that papaya live resin pod. It's so damn tasty. Plus, the effects punch like a dab. Truly, it only takes a couple puffs from the Aircraft 2 to get you really zooted. The AirPro is amazing. It's another proprietary system that only works with its own battery and cartridges. The battery is awesome because it vibrates when you hit it and allowing you to measure your doses. Although you can only buy their AirPod cartridges for it, you won't be disappointed with their oil. It tastes amazing, it's fun to vape, and there are a whole lot of options, including CBD oil, distillates, live resin, and a botanical strain terpene series. Oleo Second Press Solventless Rosin Cartridges. Tasty is what I have to say about these cards. Oleo in Colorado makes a variety of extracts for people who love dabs and vape pens alike. On the vape side of things, they produce solventless rosin, second press solventless rosin, live resin, and CBD 510 threaded cartridges. The second press solventless rosin cards are some of the most flavorful 510 cartridges I've ever come across. Rosin is pressed using heat and pressure, and the process creates leftover oil, 
which is then pressed and bottled into rosin cards, hence second press. The result? Some super flavorful vapor, and if you're in Colorado, you should definitely give it a try. Now, because that list was perhaps not as Canadian as I was hoping it would be, <laughs> let's use the bottom of this article to kind of put it into perspective, regardless of where you are and what kind of cartridges you're going to be dealing. Here's some tips for how to find the best ones. Choosing a vape card starts with the type of battery you have. If you want the flexibility of 510 cartridges and access to the widest range of oils, you might want to get an upgraded battery, like a Vessel Expedition, that will last you a while and offer different temperatures. If you're going to go with a closed pod system like Pax Era or Era Pro, you've already made your hardware decision and will be limited to that brand's type of oils. The most important thing when finding a quality vape cartridge is if you want THC or CBD. There are other cannabinoids, but for the most part, THC and CBD are the most common. The industry isn't at a place yet where producers are developing CBG, CBN, and other minor cannabinoid products at mass scale. That said, THC gets you high, and CBD doesn't, but will still make your body feel good. When you look at the package of a cartridge, look at two main metrics, THC slash CBD percentage and terpene percentage. Essentially, the amount of THC or CBD will tell you how powerful the experience will be, while the terpene percentage will let you know how flavorful it'll be. If the package tells you specific terpenes, then you'll also have an idea on how the high will make you feel. As a rule of thumb, the higher the THC slash CBD percentage, the stronger the high will be. The higher the terpene percentage, the more flavorful and dynamic the vape oil will taste. And you usually can't have both. If you get a vape cartridge with 90% THC, expect that the flavor will be nil or there will be artificial flavor additives. If you get one with 18% terpenes, expect that it will explode with tasty vapor, but the effects might not punch the hardest. Everything about the quality of vape cartridges starts and ends with the oil. You don't need to be a cannabis scientist, but know that how the oil was made will influence its taste and effects. Distillates, live resin, rosin, etc. all have their own flavor profile and experience. Educate yourself with a wide variety of extraction methods that make concentrates, as well as the different types of vape oils. Once you learn basic vape tech and oil types, the next thing you should look out for is who's making the oil in the cartridge or pod. That includes producers growing the flour for source material and processors extracting oil from the bud. Knowing specific producers and processors will give you an idea of the standards and quality of your oil. If you love a company's flour or dabs, you might love their vapes as well. Oils can come in a wide variety of colors, and usually the more golden amber the color, the better. If the oil inside's got a sweet golden amber color that looks like a tree sap IPA, you're probably doing pretty good. And thanks to Dante Jordan and Leafly.ca for that information about vapes. And I have now tried the Pax Era. I have a Pax Era now, and it's pretty tasty, I have to say, and the high is pretty good. So there's a little bit of information for you on vaping, and I hope you find it useful. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And we're doing a trifecta of stories from Leafly.ca on the episode today. And the author of this one is Colleen fisher Tully. Help! I'm terrified of THC. And I felt this was relevant, not only just because it's an interesting story, but there have been some people in my life lately who have been cannabis consumers for a while and are now experiencing some difficulties with that. A little too much anxiety, perhaps just not the effects that they were after, and are finding that they have to cut weed completely out for a while. So here's why I think this is relevant. Getting high isn't always giggles and gaiety for everyone. In fact, too much of the euphoria-inducing cannabinoid, THC, can give a number of people unwanted symptoms of paranoia, dizziness, racing heart, fatigue, or sometimes a hellscape of all four. Now, if this all sounds familiar, or you're new to weed but wary, you might feel you're just not cut out for cannabis. But consider hot sauce. Some people drown their food in fiery spice, while others are content with a single drop. THC is sort of the same. And how you experience this cannabinoid? has more to do with your unique genetic makeup than other factors such as age, gender, what you ate that day, or even the number of times you've consumed it in the past. Dr. Rattan Pessinar 
medical director of Canaway Clinic, explains cannabinoid receptors have genetic variation from person to person, which is why two people can consume the same amount and yet have vastly different experiences. Each of us has a unique receptor physiology. Some people may react differently depending on their receptors, which may contribute to whether someone has an enjoyable experience or not, he says. He also points out that the feeling of being high is subjective, much the same as alcohol is enjoyed by some but not everyone. Some people may not like any feeling of impairment, and this holds true with cannabis, he offers. So, you might have sensitive cannabis receptors. Now what? The good news is we're in the age of legal cannabis, which means you can access clinical expertise combined with an enormous range of regulated products. In this day and age, medical patients and recreational consumers alike can get the most from weed without the unwanted side effects. Here's how to make it work for you. It said over and over and over again. But Passanar reiterates this wise cannabis adage, start low and go slow. Low means a really low dose of cannabis. Slow means allowing your body enough time to absorb the product fully, which can take up to four hours. This rule applies to the ingestion of cannabis oils as well as the inhalation of cannabis flour or vapor from a vaporizer, he explains. Health Canada recommends consuming edibles with less than 2.5 mg of THC and waiting up to four hours to feel any effects. If smoking or vaping, Health Canada says to start with just one or two puffs from a strain with less than 10% THC and wait up to 30 minutes. For medical patients, including recreational consumers who are self-diagnosing, Passanar emphasizes the importance of getting assessed by a cannabis-specializing physician who can guide you to the right dosage and method of ingestion. This is especially important for people who are already taking other medications to ensure interactions or risks associated with their existing treatment plans are managed properly. The legacy market laid the groundwork for today's legal cannabis, but in the decades leading up to legalization, weed was bred to contain very high THC levels, not ideal for sensitive types. Buying from legal sources not only takes the guesswork out of product potency, Passanar stresses, it's the only way you can be sure exactly of what you're getting. Current cannabis is different than the cannabis of the past, he says. Today's cannabis is highly regulated by Health Canada and includes a variety of different strains, formulations, and intake methods. This is beneficial to the medical patient as well as the new recreational consumer. In this age of CBD hype, it can be tempting to think of CBD as the therapeutic sibling to intoxicating THC, as if they're opposite sides of a cannabis moral coin. This is simply not true. Both cannabinoids, which are just two of many, have therapeutic qualities. A recent study published in Nature suggests cannabis that includes THC provides greater symptom relief for a broad range of health issues compared to consumption of CBD alone. Passanar explains the entourage effect is a theory suggesting that the entire cannabis plant provides greater therapeutic results than the individual component on its own. We have observed at Canaway that full-spectrum cannabis products provide better symptomatic relief, which may be attributed to the entourage effect, he says. When we prescribe a low dose of THC in combination with CBD and a complete terpene profile, we have seen better efficacy in many patients anecdotally than when CBD is taken on its own. And no, patients don't have to suffer through unwanted funny feelings, says Passanar. When we introduce THC to a patient, they will often start by taking it at nighttime before bed. Nighttime is when feelings of euphoria are minimized since the patient is sleeping, and there's less risk of the patient driving or operating heavy equipment. And if you go too far, first of all, Passanar reassuringly points out that no one, neither patients nor recreational consumers, has ever died from an overdose of cannabis. Let's read that again. Neither patients nor recreational consumers has ever died from an overdose of cannabis. He suggests feelings of paranoia, fatigue, palpitations, or dizziness from a high dose of THC can be countered with a high CBD product, which can block the effect of THC at the CB1 receptors and may help alleviate some symptoms. Although in very rare cases of psychosis or hallucinations, he says seek immediate medical attention. But for the vast majority of people, Time in a comfortable space is the best course of action. In addition to taking CBD, Passanar says you can also try eating a meal to slow down THC absorption in the gut, and that taking a nap may help alleviate some symptoms and kill time. Passanar reiterates that medical patients are in good hands, 
and that they should have no apprehension to using low doses of THC in conjunction with CBD. We have seen that this allows us to successfully treat a variety of medical ailments, and our patients are able to achieve better symptomatic relief and increase their quality of life. And what wasn't covered in that article, but is still face all the time, is there is a particular generation and they still fear THC terribly. They still feel that THC is going to make them insane instantly as soon as they have any of it. I wish we could get rid of that stigma. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to my corner. At this time on Cultivar Corner, we are going back. Not back to the future. Well, actually, maybe we are. <laughs> We've talked about it a couple of times since we started the podcast back at Legalization Day that we're smoking a lot of weed. But there were times when you also wanted just a bit of an extra kick. And I don't mean shatter or any of the concentrates. I mean, just a kick from inhaling some cannabis that perhaps might be a little stronger than the weed you're smoking. Well, guess what? Things have improved on the legal market once more. And today, on Cultivar Corner, we are doing Legacy Hash from Mood Ring. And I got to be honest, I was pretty impressed. Picked this up the other day, brought it home, and as I opened the package, I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to share this. My wife has some experience with hashish, as I do. She actually used to really like hashish. So I let her smell the package as soon as I opened it. And you could see the look in her eyes. And she went, ooh, oh, I haven't smelled hashish in a long, long time. And this really, truly does smell just like, well, like I remember. <laughs> I mean, you mean, your memory can only be so specific with smells, right? But in form and texture... This is really close to what Blonde Lebanese used to be. As you'll find out in the story that ends this version of the podcast, Blonde Lebanese and I have a fairly long history. I used to buy a lot of it. I used to sell a fair amount of it, too. <laughs> not, not that I'm admitting to ever actually doing that, but... So I sampled a lot, and the sample that I have in my hands right now is, in my mind, very, very reminiscent of what we used to get. It is very, very hard packed, hard-pressed hashish. You can't do anything unless you apply a little heat to this. Now, to give us a perspective before we have a taste and, and prepare this for consumption, let me tell you what they say about legacy hashish at Mood Ring. First of all, kudos to Mood Ring because I went to find some information on it, and lo and behold, it's there. Their website has a whole bunch of information. In fact, you can move your mouse around with a little image that's onto the side and that's probably going to be a lot more fun when I'm stoned, <laughs> but it's fun right now. Legacy Hashish. Moodring Legacy Hashish is a high-quality, solventless concentrate handcrafted in an authentic old-world style. Drawing from traditional methods dating back hundreds of years, we carefully extract and press the trichomes from the cannabis to create a firm, sticky block that reveals the plant's true nature. Now, it's not really sticky. I'm going to call him on that one again because it is so hard-pressed, and I do not remember Blonde Lebanese being particularly sticky either. So I don't see that as a detriment. Now, in case you're wondering, they use only high-quality dried whole flour, no trim, no shake ever. As they like to say at Mood Ring, you get out what you put in. Now, in ancient times, hashish was thought to be a way to connect with God. Well, I'm perhaps not going to comment on that, and neither are they. They can't guarantee that, but they will tell you that Legacy Hashish helps you bond with Mother Nature. That's because every time you purchase a Mood Ring product, we help plant a tree thanks to our friends at One Tree Planted. So that's pretty cool. A premium product, nice price, all while helping reforest the world. It's the cannabis trifecta. And it has nothing to do with trifecta because I'm not going to do three things with it, but I am going to prepare us up for smoking. And as I remember, my blonde Lebanese, best way to prepare it for smoke is to hold that little brick and it was one solid one gram piece. Actually, it was a little over a gram. I peeled off a little bit, tried that, and, and then weighed it. <laughs> and it was enough to get me pretty buzzed, too. So the way I've always found to consume hashish is to take my lighter or match or whatever you want to and just burn one of the corners just ever so briefly. Put a little heat onto that so that it's going to soften up the hashish a little bit. A little bit of flame's not bad. You can put that up fairly quickly. But that allows me to then, oh, oh, oh beautiful. 
to just peel away a little corner of that and just enough for a pretty good sample in the pipe. Now, hashish does not work well in my herbal vaporizer. It just kind of melts. It doesn't really do what you're wanting to. So I'm not going to be using that. It is all going to be out of the pipe for this cultivar corner. Now, what are the details? Uh, let's see. The relevant detail, the THC content. Their range, they say in their article, is 450, or rather 45% to 60%. And the hash I have in my hand, 54.1% THC. Not as high as concentrates, but I think just by the very fact that we're doing the inhalation with the hashish, it's going to be a pretty big bang. And we're about to find out. This is Legacy Hashish, very much like Blonde Ebony's from Mood Ring. Just like I often refer to when I'm tasting weed in the vaporizer. Oh, hashish has such a unique taste profile. Mm. Yeah, I still love it as much as I used to. <laughs> okay, there there may be a bit of a, a kick to the smoke. <laughs> but that's just going to get me a little more blasted. Oh, what a delightful taste. And with that single hit, there's some pretty good bang going on, too. But I'm never one to stop at just one. We're going to take this hash for a real ride. And there you go. Oh. <laughs> you hold that in and, and there's a little rush as the, as the euphoria comes bursting through. Absolutely astounding to me. Here we go again. I hear from a lot of people that are looking for some old style hash. We've sampled some. In fact, we, we featured some of it. There was a black hash we talked about a little while ago. It didn't quite live up to the billing. And that was mostly because it was so soft and, and mushy. It didn't really get that hard. Oh, that hard hashish feel and taste. That slight hesitation is as I just revel in how this pie is overwhelming. And it's a very pleasant overwhelm, I must say. It's different than weed. It's a lot different than weed. And now I don't know what strain this hash is from, but based on its blonde nature, I'm going to suggest it's a sativa. I don't know that there's a correlation between blonde and sativa. I just made that up. Sometimes you make up facts. And if nobody disputes it, then it becomes a fact, right? <laughs> Where have I heard of that lately? <laughs> Anyways, I don't know what strain is behind this, but based on what I'm feeling after a couple of hits, and I haven't even consumed everything that I put into the pipe yet. Wow. Real, real nice overflowing euphoria. Just big smile on my face. I'm in reveling in the highness right now. Mm. Now, of course, I've also used hot knives to smoke ash. Works very well for that. You get the occasional mouth burn. <laughs> a pin works really well, too. Peel off a, or rather break off just a quarter of the little chunk you got. Stick a little straight pin in that. Light some fire to it. As that burns away, it is... Peel off the end of that pin. Mm, that's a pretty sweet way to do it, too. Back in the day when you used to have lighters in cars, that was also a convenient way to smoke some hashish fairly quickly without much rig necessary. And in this instance, there wasn't much rig necessary other than a tiny little silver pipe. And that's one of the other things I really like about hash. It just vanishes. You put these... <laughs> You put these pretty little brown chunks, these pretty little blonde Lebanese looking like chunks in your bowl. You light some fire to that. You take a couple of hits. You get high and you look in the bowl and it's just turned to ash and then just kind of disappears. <laughs> oh, 
Am I ever glad I gave this a try? I was hoping. I had been hoping for a while that there was there was a hash out there or there was a concentrate out there that that could get me that really, really buzz feeling. I think I found it. <laughs> and of course, if you have listened to the podcast at all, you you know that I perhaps don't exercise as much restraint as one might. Feeling a pretty good high and, and would just kind of leave it there. And, and what do I do? Yep, I've loaded up the bowl again. <laughs> and I'm going for round two because this is just, oh, I'm liking this. And that all familiar taste of hashish. Oh, it is such a sweet, sweet taste. There's a lot of people that are going to be liking this. People who used to like picking up some hashish, whether it was the blonde Lebanese or the black Afghani. Those are the two primary ones that came into my world. Blonde Lebanese was always one of my favorites. Oh, and I am so happy to tell you. We have finally reached the state in the legal cannabis market in Canada where we have a hash that lives up to that legacy. And that's Legacy Hashish from Moodring. Well done. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And this is probably the first time that the story that I'm going to finish with is kind of tied into what we were talking about on Cultivar Corner. And that is hash, hashish, or more specifically, blonde Lebanese hash. Back in the day, when this particular story occurred, I used to get a lot of blonde Lebanese hashish. I had a contact in Vancouver that was fairly consistent, and a visit down there could yield me a ounce of hashish at a fairly decent price, and back to my hometown, where it was consumed and, and, and sold to many different people. Not that I was a big time dealer or anything like that, but you know, it was kind of my sidebar business <laughs> as we go. So, anyways, this was time I was heading down to, an, and also at the time, uh, I was a promoter. Uh, I put on dances, brought in bands, and you know, did all the promotion, set all the uh, stuff up, and contracts, and everything like that. Again, a little bit of a sidebar, I guess. Well, I had booked, I can't even remember who the band was. It was a fairly hot Vancouver band at the time. Might have been Seeds of Time or um, The Collectors or, you know, all the precessors to Chilliwack. It, anyways, could have been one of those. Can't remember who, uh, who <laughs> which band I had booked. But I, for some reason, I decided that that was the, the time that I needed to go to Vancouver and, and pick up some more hash. And my timing wasn't particularly good here. Uh, <laughs> I got to Vancouver and things got delayed. It didn't happen and I had to wait an extra day. So I ended up, picking it up and, and it was a oh it was a beautiful ounce and as I'm looking at that I'm looking at this legacy hash that I talked about in Cultivar Corner very very reminiscent of it mm, reminds me of what a whole ounce of that would look like mm -hmm. anyways so my trip was delayed I had actually been supposed to have been back in town well before and at the beginning of the day that I came back because that was the day that uh, this band was performing at, at a local hall, and although I had people ready to set it up and, and do all that, I wasn't worried about it actually getting started. I needed to make sure that the band got paid and that we got all the money we were supposed to, so I wanted to get back for it. And leaving when we did, hitchhiking is perhaps not as reliable as one hopes it is, but at that time in my life, that was the method of travel. You needed to go somewhere, especially between Williams Lake and the coast. Well, you hitchhike. The buses ran, yeah, but it cost money and wasn't all that convenient. It was kind of crappy sitting in that bus for that long time. So you hitchhike. That's how you got by, and you usually got rides pretty quick. Well, except when you need to. A friend was traveling with me. We had, we had made the trip together, and we were leaving Vancouver, and oh, it took forever. It took forever for us to finally get a ride out of, I think we were going off the first avenue exit. It took forever to get that first ride. Like we, we left it. I think we made the deal fairly early in the morning, which is unusual for a, a drug deal in the first place. But we were on the road, I think by 10 or 11 or something like that. And it took us 
three or four hours before we even got to Chilliwack. <laughs> and there we were at Chilliwack. We were on one of the exits, I guess one of the on-ramps into the freeway, and that's what we were hitchhiking on, which you're not supposed to do. As we were dutifully informed by an RCMP officer who got out of the car, informed us that we shouldn't be hitchhiking where we were, and did we have some ID, and uh, he felt that he should uh, give us a little search. Isn't that weird that we just allowed that to happen? I guess that's the difference between legalization today and the way it was when it was still illegal. Uh, they just had the right to ask and do anything they want, so we gave him ID. And needless to say, as I handed him my backpack, there was a touch of paranoia that entered into my mind, knowing that inside that pack was an ounce of hashish that I was preparing to start selling when we returned. And this is one of those times in life where it, uh, I do believe in the universe. Something happened. The universe got in the way. He made a pretty thorough search of my pack, I thought. But he didn't find the ounce of hash. Or if he did, he said absolutely nothing. And I can't believe that he, that he saw it and, and didn't say anything about it. He ended up saying, okay, I know he didn't find anything. It's hard to believe that that is. <laughs> But he insisted that he take us off the freeway. And so he did and took us back to a gas station that was pretty close to the to the ramp. Now, again, I'm supposed to be back in, in town to start this dance, and it's probably it's probably five, five, five o'clock now. It's taken just a long time for this day to proceed. And I figure I should phone home to let my mother know where I am and, and that I'm I'm gonna get back. I'm just gonna be a little late and I needed to tell a few people that. So I mistakenly phoned home and told my mother, and what I told her was that we had been stopped by the police in Chilliwack, and that had caused a delay in us getting back, but I was going to make it back, uh, and just to please call these people, tell them I'm not going to get back, they need to start things up, I hope to be there before the show ends. I don't know if you ever played that telephone game in elementary school where you started a story with one person. And they told it to the next person. And by the time it completely came around the classroom, the story was completely changed. <laughs> well, by the time we got back, and it was now 10.30 at night, I believe, dark, we'd finally gotten a ride that, that went all the way when we snuck back onto the freeway and started hitchhiking again. I arrived at this hall where the dance was again just about ending. And all the people were there, and they said, oh, wow, man, you made it. I said, what do you mean we, we made it? Yeah, it, it took a bit of time. I said, well, no, we, we talked to your mom, and she said you got busted on the freeway in Chilliwack. <laughs> that's what the story is somehow. Uh, that's how, and, and again, I don't know whether she said that, or by the time it got through the people who translated it, that was what happened, is that I had got busted on the freeway in Vancouver with an ounce of hash, and that's why I didn't make it to the dance. So <laughs> there is no moral to this story. It's just one of those odd events that happened when cannabis used to be illegal, and I'm so happy that we are in a different world now. And I'm also happy that you're still here and that you're along for the ride. If you ever have a comment on anything you hear on the Cannabis Podcast, I would love to hear it. Send it along to info at CannabisPodcast.com. If you're looking for the links for any of the stories, you will find them associated to the episode back at CannabisPodcast.com. And that wraps it up for episode 75 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Are you looking for the next great cannabis business to invest in? Then you need to check out the MJ Bulls podcast. Hi, I'm Dan Humston. Join me each week as I speak to both cannabis entrepreneurs who are raising capital and cannabis investors who are investing capital. 
Our 10-minute episodes are perfect for the busy investor. Start listening to the MJ Bulls podcast today, wherever you listen to podcasts, and who knows, maybe you'll discover the next cannabis unicorn.